Welcome to the Better Together podcast, where we look for ways we can work together to advance the cause of Christ among free will Baptists and around the world. Today we have here with us Miss Molly Bradley Hudson. She is the author of the book Saving Sycamore, The School Shooting That Never Happened. You may have heard of this event. It took place on 9-28-2016, 20, a little over four years ago. But because of what happened in that particular situation, Molly was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, Citizens Honor recipient. She's been to a lot of different places, and uh, Lord willing, she will continue to go uh, to many different places talking about what's happened. So before this event, she was an educator and a school counselor. She's a graduate of Western Kentucky University, that's where she got her school counseling degree and her undergraduate degree as well. And Molly, you have been to a lot of places, but really the Lord prepared you for what happened on this particular date back in September of 2016, didn't he? He sure did. That That's definitely true, Brother Eddie. Well, look, how did you come to, I mean, you've written this book. Tell us, Tell us a little bit about this book, and I, I need to say, first of all, wow, the people who've endorsed it. So people that are aware of, like, school shooting research will know the name Peter Langman. So he's mm -hmm. written a wonderful endorsement of this book and talks about how important it is that folks would read it. Uh, folks right. may recognize the name Frank DeAngelis. He was the mm -hmm. principal there at Columbine High School, and so he has also indicated how important it is that – uh, one would read it, and you've got even an endorsement, you know, from Charlie Daniels a couple of days yeah. probably before he passed away, mm -hmm. um, as well as folks who've won the Medal of Honor like Major General William B. Baines. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, this is good stuff, Molly. A lot of important people who uh, know about these things have said you need to take this book and, and you need to read it. So what led you to write this particular book? Well, I have to be honest, I had really not intended to write a book. Um, I had, when this incident happened, we had a wonderful centerstone therapist on staff whose name is Stephen Sellers. And Stephen came to me probably, I don't know, the afternoon or the day following this event and said to me very kindly, uh, Molly, when you're ready to talk to someone, we will find the right person for you. And it only took me a second to realize he was talking about a therapist or a counselor. And I said, Stephen, I'm fine. I don't, I don't need to talk to anybody. And he said, okay, I, okay. But, but if you do, we'll, we'll find someone. Um, at the time we were so inundated by media. Um, this was a, a very unusual situation. I'm going to share a little bit of the story in just a minute, but because of that, I really closed ranks and made the decision not to do any, any media requests, uh, not our local newspapers, not any of the, the national or international syndicates. We, I didn't talk about this story at all. So I was very concerned about finding a counselor that um, would actually maintain confidentiality. I was very concerned about that. And so I expressed that to Stephen the following week. I had started having um, some physical uh, symptoms show up that maybe something was was off a little bit. I had uh, been shaking some at night, some things that were not normal for me. And I, I did want to talk to a medical professional about that. And so uh, Stephen decided and it, with me together that even though it was a little unorthodox, we thought it would probably be best for me to talk to him. I did know him uh, personally, and we had worked together some, but it still uh, it still felt like the right fit at the time. So Partway through our, our sessions, Stephen suggested to me that I write down some things that I remembered because it was really important for us to process the entire uh, 90 minutes of that day. And so I had written some things down to share with him and he laughed and said, this looks more like, uh, I don't know, like a five paragraph essay. I can tell you're a teacher. And then he said, wait a second, really? You know, it really, it looks more like chapters in a book. And he said to me that day, Molly, you need to hold on to this. And I said, I'm not writing a book. <laughs> and I really had no intention. And so um, in the summer of 2019, in June, actually, I learned that Frank DeAngelis, De who had been the principal at Columbine High School when the shooting took place there in 1999, I learned that he had written a book. And the first thing that struck me 
was, wow, this man waited 20 years to tell his story. And so I bought it immediately on Amazon, had it shipped to me as fast as I could get it and read it almost all in one night. And around midnight that night, I was struck by the fact that he had talked so much about his faith. He had used scripture references, some things that were very important you know, to me. And, and I thought, how did he find someone to publish this because I had learned and had heard a little bit that it's difficult, uh, sadly, sometimes to get things published that are religious in nature. And so I flipped to the back of the book and I saw that it was published by a company called Dave Burgess Consulting. And I immediately went, oh, Dave Burgess, because in teacher world, the Burgesses are very important. Um, Dave wrote his first book, uh, Teach Like a Pirate, and had gone through the process to have it published, but felt like that all of the publishing companies wanted to change or alter something that was important to him. And he wanted the book to stay intact. And so he had done so much research at that point, he decided to publish the book and amazed everybody when it over time became a New York Times bestseller. So Dave and his wife Shelly said, hey, if we can do this for ourselves as educators, what could we do for other teachers? So they had started publishing um, books for for teachers, mostly professional development books. Ironically, Frank DeAngelis' book was their first memoir. And so when I found out it was the Burgesses, I just Googled it, looked it up, and, and they had on their website, if you think you have a book idea, send us an email. And I thought, well, that's even more amazing because most of the time, if you're trying to get a book published, you need an agent and you really need an in. Somehow you need a connection somewhere. And so I sent them an email that night around midnight. I sent a link to the ABC News story and just told them a little bit about the situation. And they contacted me the next day. And Shelly and I did a meeting um, online. They are in San, they live in San Diego and in Hawaii. And so she did, did a meeting with me uh, over Zoom, I think, or Google Meets. And I had a chance to really tell her the story. And so they discussed it with their team at Dave Burgess Consulting. And two weeks later, they contacted me and said, Molly, we want to publish your book. Um, Working with them has been the most amazing experience because they did not alter or change anything in the book or even want me to that was important to me. So it was, I knew that I would never tell the story if I could not tell it all the way that I I remembered it best. And if I could, if I had to change or alter any part of talking about my faith, I knew I would not be able to do it. I even said to them when we first interviewed about the book, I said, I really don't care if it ever gets published or not. My boys will have this story. It's typed out on the the computer and, you know, Microsoft Word or whatever, but but it's it was really more of a catharsis and it was a chance for, for them to see it. So they agreed to publish this book and I had only written not even half of it. So they have been amazing to work with and really understood the story. Mm-hmm. So um, would you like me to tell you part of it? Would that yeah, be and, probably and, helpful? Uh, we need to tell our... our let our listeners know you're in the room where it happened. Right, right. I'm, I'm sitting exactly where I was sitting on September 28th of 2016. My office, like a lot of offices, is set up so that there's usually only, only one place to plug in the phone and the internet. And so there's very few ways to change uh, office furniture around when you're, when you're kind of tied to those two things. So uh, this story took place, as you mentioned at the beginning, four years ago. I am a middle school counselor here at Sycamore. I have been here at Sycamore since I graduated from Western Kentucky in 1998. So uh, going in my 22nd year here at Sycamore, I, I was a teacher first. I taught uh, eight years English, seventh and eighth grade English. And then we had an opening to teach advanced English or move into the counseling department. And by that point, I'd finished my master's, which I also did at Western. And I made the decision to move into the counseling department, not really knowing what a plan God had in store for me. So I had been counseling for quite a few years at the time that this happened, but had been here at my school for 18 years. So I was very familiar with the staff and the students, the community, families. And that morning I was in my office getting ready for the day and a young man came in. And he said, you know, Miss Hudgens, I I need to talk to you. Can I come back today during Related Arts, which is the class period where they have music or band or choir or art, health, those classes. So I checked my planner. I didn't have anything scheduled. I said, honey, that sounds great. 
you know, let me know if I need to get you a note for your teacher. And he left. Um, I never felt anything strange or unusual about it. I did feel a little mystified because I had just met with him the Friday before, and this was the following Wednesday. And so um, I did my rounds in the morning where I walked the hallways here at Sycamore and had just gotten back to my office and started eating breakfast actually when he came back in. And he said, uh, I don't think I can wait to talk to you until related arts. Can I talk to you now? And obviously there was a sense of urgency, but when kids are in middle school, what is going on in their lives is always urgent to them. It's important to them. And so I said, sure, you know, go on over into my office. And I was actually eating breakfast in the other counselor's office. We were meeting. And so I remember dropping my dishes in the sink outside my office, coming in, closing the door, walking around and sitting down right here uh, with no sense of foreboding, no sense of any kind of foreshadowing of, of evil or anything bad about to come. And we started talking. Um, he did seem agitated, uh, again, not uncommon for middle school kids, but probably about 10 minutes into the conversation, he started to ask me some questions that were concerning in nature. And I remember noticing that my heart rate increased quite a bit. At the time I was training to run the Bowling Green uh, Marathon with my college roommate. And so I was in pretty good shape, did a lot of running and noticed that that seemed strange because my heart didn't pound that much even when I was running. Um, and then I felt the sensation, almost like somebody had poured something warm on top of my head and it was running down my body. And I remember getting a little bit dizzy and thinking, don't faint. And that's when I knew, I knew something was wrong. And um, I, in my head, I just heard or, or thought, I'm not sure, somehow the Lord gave it to me. He's got a gun. And I remember immediately starting to think about all the options that I had. The room in which I'm sitting uh, is, is somewhat of a cul-de-sac. There's only one exit. And that exit is behind the desk where I'm sitting. So I am, am kind of um, blocked in where I am. So I knew that the only thing separating him from the students and the staff in our school was the door of my office. He had just come through the door of our outer office and the doors to their classrooms. All uh, I, these two doors would have been unlocked obviously for him to exit, but the door to the classrooms would have been locked. Um, but still, I knew that there was nothing really separating them from him except for me. And I remember saying this prayer, you know, Lord, if there's anything separating you from me, take it away. And I thought about my grandmother. I thought, am I going to, am I going to die today in this room <laughs> wearing this black shirt and this black and white palm tree skirt that I don't even like? I mean, I remember it's funny how the Lord will give you moments of humor in the midst of great, uh, great fear. But um, I, I remember thinking that, you know, um, he can't leave this room no matter what happens. And I had never thought, nor would I ever think about harming anyone, especially a child, but I knew that I couldn't let him leave the room. And I knew that if, I, if, if it came to me having to try to take the weapon and, and something happened, um, I would fight. I would fight hard, you know, to, to protect myself, to protect the kids. And so, um, as we continued to talk, again, he has not at this point mentioned anything about having a weapon. I, I didn't know that for sure at the time. But as we continued to talk further, he then at one point said to me, I feel like I have something to tell you, but I'm not sure if I should. And I knew exactly what he was going to say. And I, and I said, well, um, honey, I've been to this job for a long time, so I'm not sure what you're going to tell me, but I'm sure whatever it is, it's probably something I've heard before all the while knowing it probably wasn't something I had heard before. Um, but he said, I, I bet nobody's ever told you they've got a gun before. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I remember the hair, you know, kind of stand up on my neck and I am, I am, I've already prayed, Lord, take this, you know, separate, take this away from me. And I remember saying, praying, just um, help me be bright, take care of my boys, like all these things that you would think. And then I had this flash of the training that I had created. And I talk about this in the book, but it, to me, this is the, the sheer miracle of the whole story. Because I started here at Sycamore the year that Columbine happened. And for reasons I didn't understand at the time, started researching school shootings. I, I read every book I could find by mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, school administrators, law enforcement, juvenile courts, anybody that I knew had written something that was uh, significant and, and data, data based. Mm -hmm. And um, I 
did this for 10 years from, from 1999 until 2009. I read everything I could find and I wrote a training in 2009 called recognizing red flags and educators role in preventing school violence. And it's an in-depth psychological study of about 30 school shooters. So, you know, the Lord spent a good 10, really more like 18 years of my life preparing me for that moment. So I had this flash of just not my life flashing before my eyes, but just all of these, these kids that I had read about and learned about all these stories. And I remember thinking for such a time as this, it's like it just, the story of Esther has never meant more to me than it does now. Um, because I really, it really became clear to me I and mean, people, people kind of thought it was strange. You know, why you're a middle-aged woman. What, why are you studying about school shootings? Uh, people ask me about it a lot. And I, in some ways I felt kind of like I was Noah building an ark and nobody had ever seen it rain, yeah. you know, but now they all want to know about my ark and I'm wow. so glad to share it with them. And, and I do, but so going in, so in the middle of this situation, I'm realizing now all of a sudden I'm having this epiphany. This is what the Lord was preparing me for. This had nothing to do with me writing a training or teaching a training. You know, we, we know from uh, William Glasser that we learn the most from what we teach to others. So 95% of my knowledge was because I'd been teaching it, yeah. but the Lord had given me all of that and what a miracle. So um, at the point that he, he mentioned, you know, having the gun, um, he unzipped his coat and he pulled it out and he laid it on the, the desk where I'm sitting, laid it, you know, he was sitting right across from me, laid it on the desk and then pulled out an additional magazine of ammunition. And I could see that the, the bullets in the, in the magazine. And I remember trying to count them frantically and thinking, you know, what would happen if I emptied it, you know, and hoping that because the magazine was separate from the gun, that it wasn't loaded. I would not find out until later that it was the second magazine. The gun was fully loaded uh, and with a magazine and even a bullet in the chamber. So um, I, as he put those on my desk, I stood up right from where, where I am, st stood up and then I leaned over and put my hands out and said, why don't you let me take this from you and then we'll talk about what's going on. And he immediately yanked it all away and he shoved the magazine back in his pocket and he kept the gun in his left hand, but he pointed it at the floor. So at that point, I'm standing up he, right here and I'm thinking to myself, I am like a five foot target from him. So I, I, you know, with my hands up, I walked around the, the corner of my desk and got down on my knees beside him. Um, and I remember I put my left hand on his right shoulder and then I reached over with my right hand and just interlaced the fingers of my right hand with his right hand. Because at that point, he'd taken the gun out with his right hand, so I'm assuming he's right-handed. And I'm thinking, okay, if, if this is gonna get bad, He's going to have to, he's going to have to shoot me with his left hand. Mm -hmm. I also knew that by putting myself in close proximity, if it became a situation where it had to become a physical, um, you know, a physical situation, I would be close enough, hopefully to have an advantage. But I also knew by being on my knees beside him, I'd read three books on hostage negotiations and I knew about, you know, relinquishing control, letting him feel like he was in power. I, I didn't want to do anything to upset or harm him. The whole time this is happening, I'm just praying nobody's going to come in the door. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my office and our counseling department is the second, you know, is second only to the front office in terms of traffic, people coming in and out. So I wasn't sure exactly what to expect or, or how that would, you know, what would happen. And so we had several class changes during the time that I'm on my knees beside him. And we are talking about everything, having a lot of conversations. Um, he obviously he said to me, I came to you because I think you're the only person that can talk me out of this. And I remember saying, well, let's, let's talk about it. And we talked about a lot of it. We talked about options and, and it became very clear to me that um, this was not a child who was bent on uh, revenge. This was not a, a situation where he was trying to get even with someone for something that had happened. This was a child in the middle of a, 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 a mental health crisis. This was, um, I, I knew that for sure based on what he was saying to me. And so at one point in the conversation, because, you know, I, I am on my knees with beside him now at this point for probably about 45 minutes. And I remember saying to him, I, honey, I don't know what it is, but I feel like God has a plan for your life. And he turned in the chair and looked down at me and he said, Miss Hudgens, do you believe in God? And I remember my heart sank into my stomach and I thought, why did I say that? He's going to kill me. And I thought about um, a student at Columbine who had been under the table and had been asked if she believed in God. And she actually said, I do. And the shooters had asked her, 
why? And she said, because that's what my parents taught me. And I thought about Peter and I thought, Lord, if I'm going to die, you know, I, I can't deny you right now. <laughs> this is it. And so I, I don't I swallowed whatever I had left and just, and just said, um, well, honey, I, I do believe in God, but I feel like you don't. Is there a reason you don't? Mm -hmm. And he said, do you know how many times I have prayed for help and God has never sent me any? And I just said, well, what do you think this is? And I said, you know, maybe he, maybe he wasn't telling you no, maybe he was just telling you to wait. And I remember telling him, um, I'm not sure what we're going to do, but I promise you I will not leave you and we will figure it out. We will do something. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me. Here I am worried, but, you know, can I talk about God to this kid? I'm in a public school. And then I thought, how silly is that? <laughs> And I remember thinking the worst thing they're going to do is fire me, mm -hmm. but I've got to do something. And all I have is my fa That's all I've got right now is the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I remember looking at him and saying, you know, you mentioned God, w would you be offended if I prayed with you? And I was shocked when he said, no, I, I, that'd be okay. And needless to say, I prayed the more, most heartfelt prayer of my life. And you talk about, the words pound the throne of grace, again, have a whole other meaning for me. I mean, I remember praying so hard. I was sweating. I'm sweating right now telling you about it. I was sweating all over. Um, but my heart pounding, tears running down my face, and me saying out loud, you know, Lord, whatever negative entity is affecting this situation, remove it from the equation. Just pray and, and, and feeling um, just this, heaviness uh, that I don't, I, I don't even know that I really can describe it other than that. The whole time I kept my eyes open, praying with my eyes open, I was, I was afraid to close them and his eyes were squint shut and tears were running down his face. And when the prayer ended, he seemed more relaxed and, and I had asked him for the gun many times during the course of our conversation. He would always tell me he wanted to give it to me, but he just felt like he couldn't. And, and that time I said to him, um, why don't you give me the gun? And he said, I, th you know, I think I want to give it to you. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, instead of giving it to me, why don't you let me take it? I'll lean over and take it. And then you don't have to give it to me because I knew how much in his mind he was giving up by giving up that weapon. And so he leaned over and put the safety on. And that's when I, I think I, I went, it is, you know, it is loaded. And when I leaned over to take it, because I was still on my knees beside my to lean across his body to do that, he, he put his arms and, and we hugged each other. Mm. And I remember patting him, you know, patting, patting him with one hand and the other hand I'm holding what I now know is a fully loaded gun because it's so heavy. And, um, he was crying. I was crying. I remember telling him, I'm so proud of you. Um, you know, I, uh, you did the right thing. The right thing is never easy, but it's still the right thing. And the whole time I'm hearing in my head, just hold him like he's yours, Molly, just mm. hold him like he's yours. And, um, I had two boys, so that made sense to me. The rest of the day, um, I was very fortunate and I was able to contact the SRO. He, the child understood that we had to contact someone and um, the SRO came, he handled the situation so so gracefully. He, he interviewed the child with me present. He was so kind to him. Um, he didn't have any other weapons, which was of course, you know, a blessing. And um, then he, he left. He, they took, were able to take him out of the building without anyone other than administration the SRO and myself, even knowing what had happened. And so um, he left and I closed ranks. Mm. And I, I, other than talking to the sheriff's department, talking to my administration and very briefly sharing just with our staff that they knew that, that there had been a gun found at school. They didn't know the situation. Uh, we, we did not share that until the following day when the sheriff held a news conference. I did not know that he was going to name me in that conference, um, but he did. And he, I jokingly say it must have been a slow news week um, because the story, he said two things that I think resonated with people. One of them is he said, Miss Hudgens is a hero. She did something that even people, a lot of people in law enforcement couldn't have done, which I certainly didn't, nor will I ever feel like it was something heroic. I did exactly what anybody in this school would have done had a child come to them in the same crisis. But he said that, I think that struck with people. And the other thing is he, he shared with them 
that the child said, I came to you because I think you're the only person who can talk me out of this. And people from all over the world, from as far away as Asia and, and Africa contacted us and said, what do you have? What does your school have? What do you do? What do you know that would make a kid have, you know, have opportunity means and victims and still come to you and say, you know, I can't help me not do this. What, what is that? And, um, and I knew what it was, you know, the Lord, I had had this meeting with the child the week before we had formed a good rapport. I had been given these, this wonderful opportunity to connect with him. And then, you know, on the worst day of his life in the middle of the worst crisis he could ever experience, this is where he came. Uh, what an honor for me. Um, greatest compliment I'll probably ever receive professionally or personally. So I held on to that story and I didn't talk about it. Uh, until March of 2017, which is about six months later, when I had been contacted by the um, Congressional Medal of Honor Society and told that I was going to become a recipient of the Citizens Honor. So when I, we, Jason, my husband, and I traveled to Washington, D.C. for that ceremony, and I met Roger Donlin there, who is a Medal of Honor recipient from Vietnam. Mr. Roger came in on the end of an interview I was doing with Stars and Stripes, the first interview I had, I had done. And at the end of that, he came to me and said, Molly, that is, that's not your story. That's God's story. And he has, for some reason, chosen you to be the storyteller. And I couldn't even speak because I think I needed someone to give me permission. I was waiting on somebody to say it's okay to share this. And so I came home and I started to share it some with churches and and I started traveling to do my training. And over the course of the past four years, I've traveled all over the country um, sharing mostly this story. I thought people would be interested in the training, but really for the most part, they just want to hear the story. You know, how do you have something like this happen and how is it successful? So again, never planned to write a book, uh, but then the opportunity presented itself. And I said, you know, maybe it's time, maybe it's time to do that. With a, with a publishing company that would, would allow me to maintain um, the privacy I needed to about certain parts of the story, things that I will, would never share, will never share, and um, also g give me the opportunity to, to have this published by people who are well-known, who could have the book move like it has all over the country. So I am still standing in amazement. It, it, uh, tomorrow. It will have been out for a month. We know now that it can be purchased in all 50 states. Obviously, it can be purchased online. Uh, it's, it has, it's on publishing sites from Finland and Norway and, um, and China and just places all over the world. And, and I just still stand in awe. <laughs> First, that the Lord gave this to me. You know, what an honor. Um, to have an opportunity like this. My, my testimony before this would have been pretty boring, <laughs> but now I can tell people, I spent 40 years thinking I was living and I plan on spending the next 40 living yeah. and sharing what God can do when you ask for help. That was the one and only time in my life I have not had anything else to rely on but the Lord. And you talk about stepping out on faith. I had never done that in that type of way. So, it was a miracle, and I'm just so blessed now that this story is having a chance to inspire and encourage other people, um, and it, it is written in such a way that it tells the story of what happened that day, but it also tells all of the events leading up to that that I believe came into play in that 90 minutes here, here in my office. So the odd number chapters are that day. The even number chapters are the events leading up to that day. And then it converges at the end to talk about my life some sense with, of course, the Charles H. Coolidge National Medal of Honor Heritage Center in Chattanooga, where I'm on the advisory board now. Um, and getting to be part of the Shepherd's Men, which is an organization that combats veteran suicide connected to the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Just some things that are really near and dear to my heart. I have had a chance to share on a, a whole nother level. So. Just, it, just such a blessing, Brother Eddie. Is, <laughs> just a blessing. And, but it is a good way for people to realize God's made everyone for, for something. You know, God mm -hmm. has uniquely, you think about Psalm 139. He's, yes. We're all fearfully and wonderfully made. And, you know, in the book, you talk about the 
all the things from the past. And mm-hmm. it, in some ways it reminds me sometimes of, uh, you know, Captain Sully, you know, he was made to land that plane on the way to Charlotte on the Hudson, you know, you were made for this event. And I think for what's happening since, and it tells all of us be alert, you know, take advantage of the opportunities you mm-hmm. have. It's, uh, it's kind of like Psalm 37, four to light yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You wanted to study this stuff. Right. Boom. You know, people probably thought it was crazy, but they did, <laughs> it, it, you know, but it was, it was preparing you for right. what God had for you to do that day. And, and everybody's God's preparing you for something. If you'll listen and, and be ready. And then I think we get so involved in, you know, politics and so forth. You didn't have to worry about, you know, laws against prayer in school. Mm-hmm. But everybody's glad y'all prayed that day. You know? They are. And, you know, I think I worried so much about that and no one ever questioned it. They yeah. didn't. And it's so ironic that you mentioned Captain Sullenberger because the week leading up to this, his book was one that I was reading on the treadmill. And so I, I, I have said, you know, he talked a lot about all these events in his life that explained yeah. how he was able to land that plane in the Hudson. And, and I think when we look back on our lives, I think we are able to see times that God has really moved and allowed things like that to happen. Maybe it's not always in such a, as grand a scale as this situation that, you know, that we experience. but you're exactly right. You, we are all born with a purpose. And when people talk about life, I think that's something we sometimes take for granted is you never know how one small thing that you do may really affect a sequence of events that you never see. And that, that's one of the things I'm excited about heaven is that yeah. we'll have the chance to see some of these things that we never knew about uh, as they were unfolding here on earth, but that we were part of, you know, there right. and, or, or um, that, that he had planned for there for us to then see. So it is exciting to, to think about how every person has within them the that's courage right. to rise up and do something they never thought possible. With you, the Lord, you can do even more. You I mean, alluded to that a minute ago. You met with this guy before mm-hmm. and had good rapport with him. Right. Um, and so whether a person's a student listening to this or mm-hmm. you know, a parent uh, or, you know, someone in your church, wow. You know, what if you had been busy or a little irritable mm-hmm. that day? This Then this deal would have gone down a lot different. So. Right. Right. Just one little conversation sometimes that we have with people or being friendly or letting the fruit of the spirit come out in our lives. Whoa, what a difference mm-hmm. it sure does make, doesn't it? It is. And, and, you know, we forget, we forget that we're the hands and feet of Christ and, mm-hmm. and we're the face too. Sometimes that's all that, that certain people will ever see that they have not had the fortune of growing up with a church family or in a church home or just having Christian people around them. Not everyone is, is that blessed. And, and so there is a, a, a longing to be around people who have that, you know, we exude a love they don't understand or have ne- maybe have never had presented to them. And, So I try to think about that still. I still have the same job here at Sycamore. Like I said, still in the same office. Um, I try to think about that still. Now every kid that comes in, I try really hard to not think about other things on my to-do list or how many kids I need to see that day. Or I try to really, really look at them, really think about what they're saying and why they are there. Because I realize how important every conversation is we have with someone. You know, if you get on an elevator with a person, I speak to everybody on the elevator. Jason always makes fun of me, but for some reason, I just think about the fact that we were there with them for some reason. There, yeah. There's some reason our, our paths have crossed and those interactions are really important. Well, that goes back to what you mentioned about heaven. You know, one day we'll see, I believe, you know, the Lord talked about a cup of cold water, you know, visiting right. in certain situations. Right. I think we'll see all of that change the trajectory that uh, many lives went on. Well, you well should, I say go with ahead. this book, if this, with this book, if, if even one person's life is saved, it will have been worth writing it. I mean, we know Jesus would have died for even one of us. Yeah. And I have thought that over and over. If just one person reads this book and it causes them to reach out for help if they're struggling or to, to find someone to talk to uh, if they, if they need, just need someone to pray with them or just be present with them, or maybe they'll read it and they'll think of someone in their own lives that 
and, and go, hey, maybe this person's struggling. Maybe I need to connect with them and see if they need someone to talk to or, or just be with them. And so I think that, again, I, as, like I said earlier, I can't wait for heaven to see how many people are affected because this is not, it is not my story. It really isn't. It's God. That's why it's called Saving Sycamore. It's about how God saved Sycamore and used, you know, used me to be an instrument in that process and, and how I just get to tell about it. You know, um, that's, that's the part that it's my favorite is, is that I believe as long as I continue to give him glory for it, the story will be significant. I, Cause if, if it's about me, it's not going to be, it's going to lose significance. And I, I would much rather it be about him and it be a story of significance than just a story of success because those pass, um, but this will not. There so. you go. Well, I encourage folks to get a copy of it. You can do so at Amazon.com, mm -hmm. BarnesandNoble.com, as we mm -hmm. like to say, everywhere good books are sold. <laughs> and um, you mentioned, I think earlier, it's available in all 50 states. And I, I do encourage you, if you go into a bookstore, it doesn't hurt to say, hey, do you have that book, Saving <laughs> Sycamore? Because then they'll put it on the shelf, hopefully. And and I, I encourage folks to go, you know, mm -hmm. if you bought it on Amazon, you're a verified, um, I guess they call it verified buyer or verified <laughs> customer. <leader. laughs> yeah. That means this person knows the book. So give it five stars. Give oh, it a thank you. You know, every, that's how we kind of get the message out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So every little well, bit. And, and we do, I have to, I have to give a shout out to our hometown bookstore, a Stonebridge books and gifts in Ashland city, Tennessee. They do have it in their store and also Barnes and Noble. Um, it is in their physical location at Indian Lake in Hendersonville. So okay. uh, I'm very, we're very, that was a lot of fun to get to yeah. go there and see yes. the book there on the shelves. So I'm grateful for them for actually having it available to people who maybe don't shop online much or right. have access to those types that of is a good a good thing if you have those bookstores in your community support them and definitely they do need it you know mm -hmm. uh, they need folks to they, this has been a tough little stretch for them so we encourage them to do that well molly thank you for taking the time to share with us today and for taking the time to write this book and well. and and just uh the way you've let the lord work in your life and use you we appreciate you and we're excited to see what's happened and looking forward to these other things that we know are going to take place as well. Right. Well, thank you so much, Brother Eddie, for having me on here to, to share about this. I really appreciate that. And I hope it'll touch someone who's listening today. I'm sure it will. And, and we want to thank you all that are listening today. We want to encourage you to take a moment, maybe like the at Better Together NAFWB Facebook site if you've not done that yet. That's another place to go and give us a good review. And if you're on YouTube, we encourage you to go to NAFWB, like the page, subscribe, and take this podcast, share it with friends. We encourage you to share it on your social media sites. Let's try to get this information out as much as we can because this is really information worth sharing that makes a difference in people's lives. Thank you for being with us and thank you for joining us today.